We feel an innate sense of balance in the real world, and we also like to see balance in designs in art as well, because it gives us a sense of comfort and makes us able to understand what we are looking at. It makes us feel a sense of stability. There are different ways of creating balance in your designs and different types of balance. Sometimes artists will also use imbalance in a design to create a feeling of an unease, surprise, or drama. Balance and visual weight. Balance is created in a design by arranging forms around a vertical or horizontal axis to create equal visual weight. This can be done using value, which is relative lightness or darkness, color, texture, size and type of shapes, arrangement of shapes in relation to the distance from the axis and to each other, and weighting of forms to the top or the bottom of the design, as well as use of the negative space. A well-balanced design creates a sense of ease and interest. Balance creates a sense of unity in a work where all of the pieces fit together perfectly as a whole, which is easily understood. In Jan Vermeer's painting, Woman Holding a Balance, painted in 1664, he was a Dutch painter, you can see that he's used many elements to create a well-balanced, coherent, and moving work. And one of the, the key um, hallmarks of his work is the use of the light and the perspective in the work. You can see that the light, the lighter areas and the light is shining on the focal area of the woman holding the balance. It's an asymmetrical design. If we draw a line down the center, we can see that there's more going on on the right-hand side of the design, but it still feels well-balanced. There are three different basic types of balance. You have symmetrical balance. You can see the example on the left of the pyramid of squares. We draw a line down the center. Everything is exactly the same on either side of the axis, which is a vertical axis. And that would be called perfect symmetry because there's no variation at all. It's a mirror symmetry. We have asymmetrical balance. If we draw the line down the center, again, a vertical axis on this example in the center, we don't have the same thing on either side. We've got the larger gray rectangle, which is at the top, and then we've got the three, uh, sorry, six smaller black squares at the bottom on the other side. So we don't have the same thing on either side in asymmetrical balance, but it still feels balanced. And then we have radial balance, which is a different type of symmetry. In radial balance, you have a circular design, and whatever angle you draw your axis from, whether you're doing, we, you can see here they've drawn a vertical and a horizontal axis. Even if I were to draw a diagonal through it at any point, it will be the same on either side of that axis. Asymmetrical or informal balance has more on one side of the axis than the other, and it's used more commonly in two-dimensional art because it seems more natural, and it just seems like what we see in the real world more. It creates a sense of motion. In fun Funeral Under Umbrellas by Henri Riviere in 1895, we see obvious asymmetrical balance with more on the right side than the left. The sweeping diagonal of the procession moves us up to the focal point of the cortege with the negative space on the left creating balance as well as the diagonal lines of the rain. We also see the influence of Japanese woodcut art which was studied by many artists of the time for its use of asymmetry and abstraction. Symmetrical or formal balance has the same thing on either side of the axis or rotational point. It's also seen in two-dimensional art and frequently in architecture as well as in nature. It can have a more static effect than asymmetry. In Henri Matisse's Tree of Life Stained Glass in the Chapel of the Rosary in Vence, we see an example of symmetrical balance, which uses shape, color, and light to create a mirrored symmetrical design with a feeling of motion and drama, which still keeps the formality of a symmetrical design. Most symmetrical designs have a central focal point, but this one has a feeling also of all over pattern with a focus moving up to the top with the smaller forms. Radial balance or rotational symmetry. In radial balance, we see a circle design where elements rotate around a central point. 
Whichever way the axis is drawn, each side will be similar. This color wheel mandala, created in sand by Tibetan monks, is an example of a radial balance design, which also incorporates a square in the center, which then becomes the center focal point, with Buddha up at the top. Crystallographic balance is often referred to as all-over pattern. In this type of balance, we see a repeated irregular or regular pattern, which has no obvious focal point or emphasis. Jasper John's print Chikata is a beautiful example of crystallographic balance, which is also frequently seen in textile designs. It uses a primary and secondary color rhythmic pattern with slightly irregular repetitions, which create a sense of motion, texture, and spatial depth as the lines seem to overlap and to move back and forth in space. The repetition of both shape, color, and texture create a feeling of unity in the design. Where the shapes or forms are placed in relation to the axis is very important in an asymmetrical design. In this painting, Pine Trees by Tohaku, you can see that we have the large group of the trees on the left-hand side, and then we have a smaller group of trees, which is very far out from the axis over to the right, and that's what creates the balance in the design. One group closer to the axis, and the smaller group farther away. Asymmetrical designs are often harder to create, and we can see in this painting by James McNeil Whistler, Nocturne in Blue and Gold. We have what we call dominant forms, which is the bridge and the piling, which is a little bit off center to the left of the center point. We have a subdominant form, which is the boat, which is at a diagonal from the bridge. And then we have what we call a subordinate form, which is the figure standing on the boat, and that becomes the focal point in the painting. You don't want to put your focal point right in the center of a design, usually, unless it's a perfectly symmetrical design. Um, you always want to have the focal point a little bit off center. In order to create balance in your design, you have to have equal visual weight on either side of an axis, whether it's symmetrical or asymmetrical. And you can use value, color, size, texture, placement and grouping, and distance from the center axis of your objects proportion and density and complexity of your objects and interest of the objects. And usually you're going to have the weight at the bottom of the design, but in this work, Tight Rope Walker by Paul Clay, you can see that the visual weight is at the top with the figure, which is a, an object of interest. It becomes an automatic focal point, and then some darker values and more complexity on the shapes that are at the top. And it almost feels like it's not based on normal gravity because we don't feel that the tightrope is tied to anything that's very substantial, so it all adds to the whole feeling of the design. In general, the design um, that you see in two-dimensional artworks, such as paintings and prints and so on, and photographs are going to be weighted towards the bottom, but not always. Visual weight and value, contrast, size, and complexity. In a design, a darker object appears to be heavier than a lighter object. That's the first example. You see the black circle appears to be heavier than the white circle. If we change the contrast by making the background black instead of white, you can see that then the white circle appears to have more visual weight. A larger object of the same value will always appear to have more visual weight, so the larger circle, circle appears to be heavier than the smaller one. And then if you have a complex object, that will always appear to have more visual weight than the simple object, like the circle in the last example. The visual weight of an object can be affected by the texture, the color, and the shape. A textured object will appear visually heavier than a smooth object. Two small objects together can balance out a larger object of the same value. A dark or smaller object appears visually heavier than a larger, lighter object. A square appears heavier than a circle of the same value. If we look at the balance scale here, you can see that the larger circle on the left is balanced out by the smaller circle, which is moved farther away from the center point. In color, 
a more saturated color will appear heavier in visual weight. A darker color will appear heavier in visual weight. And sometimes a different color, such as red, can appear heavier than the blue here. Red tends to have a lot of visual weight in designs. Normally, the visual weight will be at the bottom of a design in two-dimensional artworks. In this painting of Rouen Cathedral by Claude Monet, an Impressionist work, you can see that the design is weighted towards the bottom. You have darker values towards the bottom of the work, and then as you go up to the top, with the sunlight shining in, you have um, the more intense blue of the sky and the beiges. You also have a beautiful complementary harmony. Um, with oranges and blues and lilac and yellow. Imbalance is often used as a design technique by artists. It's not the same as asymmetrical balance, but it's often confused for that. When you have true imbalance, you're going to feel that things are tilting. And you can see in this Vertigo poster for the 1950s film by Saul Bass, we have the figures in the center in a spiral and they're falling. So when you have true imbalance, you're going to feel that things are falling, and that adds to the whole um, theme of the film and the title of the film as well. This sculpture by Izama Noguchi is another example of imbalance in art. And you can see that it's anchored to the ground, obviously, but it feels like it, it could fall because we know that if it wasn't, weren't anchored to the ground, it wouldn't be standing the way it is. So it creates a whole feeling of imbalance. And this is actually a sculpture, obviously, so it's a whole different feeling. And the different planes and motion of the different sides of the cube interact with all of the angles and the planes of motion of the buildings surrounding it. In this yoga figure, we see a very extreme example of imbalance because the figure is actually tilting and we know there's no way she could physically be standing that way. It all seems to be in contrast to the whole idea of yoga, which is about the philosophy of balance in your life, balance in your body, and so on. And then it's against a gradated background with the weight at the bottom of the design. Looking at some more examples of asymmetry and symmetry, we have one where you simply have more placed on one side of your axis than on the other. You don't have a diagonal line crossing. And we have the three apples on the left, one on the right, and they balance each other out. The Fibonacci spiral is another example of an asymmetrical design, and you have almost everything with the visual weight is on the right-hand side of the design, and then you have the swirling line, which moves you over to the left. So that line and the negative space create balance. In this painting by Kandinsky, we have a complex asymmetrical design. Almost everything is happening on the right-hand side of the design, but the focal point becomes those group of circles with the darker value up at the top left. And then they lead us back into the composition with the striped form below and back into the more active part of the design. In this Italian Renaissance work, we see use of symmetry in the design and also symmetry in the architecture. Um, it's a, a painting of the ideal city of Urbino, and you can see that we have what's called approximate symmetry because things are not exactly the same on either side of the dividing line. They're slightly different and that helps alleviate any static quality that can come sometimes with symmetrical designs. So here's an example of three different types of symmetry. You have reflection, where things are identical on either side of your axis. You have rotation, where your forms are rotating around a point, which is similar to radial design, but here we have an irregular rotation around a point. And then you have translation, where you have a regular repetition of your elements. For the first part of the project, you're going to create four balanced designs. They can be collages or drawings, or done digitally. They should be done in pen and ink, or marker if they're drawings. Two are going to be asymmetrical, and two are going to be symmetrical. The first design is going to be black on a white background. You can pick two to three geometric shapes and one organic focal point. Your second design is going to be 
white on a black background and you're going to be using one complex shape which is repeated in the design and then have an organic focal point. Now this particular design is actually a lot more symmetrical than asymmetrical. However, when you add the organic focal point in over to the right, it adds a feeling of asymmetry. Your third design is going to be a symmetrical design where you have perfect mirror symmetry. You're going to use three tones, black, white, and gray, and you're going to have a central focal point. Eventually we're going to be translating this into a triadic color harmony when we start working in color. Your last design is going to be a radial balance design. It's in a circular format with a central focal point. You can use any number of tones, two to four or more that you would like to. It's all in grayscale, and you can see this one is mapped out on a graph. You should be mapping out all of your sketches and designs on the graph um, to help you, especially the symmetrical designs, and then transfer them onto drawing paper. Here are some examples of what students did with this project, and you can see here we've got um, the first collage, the asymmetrical with two to three geometric shapes and an organic focal point design on the left, it looks kind of like a tree. You've got the repeated form and then the focal point over to the right. Design on the right, you have that beautiful sweeping form going up, almost like a, a horn shape up to the top left of the design. These were some examples of the design, the second asymmetrical design with the repeated complex shape. And actually the only one that has the complex shape is the one on the right with the stars. And then you have the star up on the top right and the beautiful use of the negative space. In the first one you have all of the swirling and diagonal circles which lead us to the focal point of the butterfly and then you have this one with the beautiful feather and then all of the um, bubbles or whatever they are swirling across in a diagonal pattern up to the top left. Beautiful use of space in all of these designs. If you'd like to, you can put all your four designs on one page. Just don't put them too close together. And you can see here the two top designs, which are beautiful, are collages, cut paper collages. And the two bottom designs are wash drawings. You can see beautiful use of the tones in um, the radial design on the right, and the re repetition of the complex shape, and the organic focal point on the left. Here's another example where she's labeled all of her designs. These were all done digitally. And you can see she's labeled them one, two, three, and four. Really, you should put the name of what each one is in case it's confusing and I don't know which collage or which design is which. You can see probably the most successful one, I think, is the first design, first asymmetrical design. In this example, we have um, marker drawings for each balance design, and you can see they're all beautifully done. Everything's beautifully spaced. You always want to have enough space, negative space around your design and separation between each design if you put them all on a grid. That's some more examples of the three-tone symmetrical design. And my favorite one is probably, or my two favorites are the one where they just used one tone. It's a beautiful design. And the one on the diagonal one from that, which was done as a collage. They have three Examples of the radial balance designs. The one on the left was a digital design using the three tones. The one in the center was a collage which was done by hand. And the one on the right was done with pen and ink and marker. And I have the last two examples. The radial design that we just looked at and the one on the right was done in a digital program which makes it probably a lot easier to do the radial balance designs. You have the graph in the program. If you're doing these all by hand, again, make sure you do them on your graph paper first because in a symmetrical design you want to have everything done perfectly. This is part two of the lecture. We're going to look at the Gestalt design principles and the whole philosophy was based on psychology about how we perceive things visually in the world, how we see written language and visual images. And psychologist Max Wertheimer, along with some others, developed a number of laws that can predict how we perceptually group things together in order to understand what we're looking at. So the word gestalt means unified whole. It's a psychology term, and it was developed 
with Max Wertheimer and other German psychologists in the 1920s. And what it means is form, essentially, and it's a way to create a unified and interesting composition and message in your design. The theories that they came up with attempt to describe how people tend to organize visual elements into groups or unified wholes when certain principles are applied. So here are the sum of the Gestalt principles. Simplicity. We like to see things in their simplest form because it's easy to understand what we're looking at. Similarity. Objects that are similar will be grouped together. Continuation. We are directed to move from or through one object or group towards another one, which will often bring us to a focal point in a design. Closure. An object which has incomplete or open borders can still be recognized because the brain fills in the missing information to see the form. Proximity. Objects that are placed close together are perceived as a group. Figure ground. The eye separates an object from its background as a figure or a positive space and the background as the ground or the negative space. Alignment. Objects that are lined up on a grid or around an axis will form a group. Symmetry. Objects which are aligned in perfect symmetry create a whole. In other words, if you have several objects grouped together and they form in a symmetrical way, they're going to be seen as one shape. Area. If two forms overlap, the smaller one will usually be seen as the figure or the positive space, and the larger one will be seen as the ground or the negative space. Emergence. The whole object is identified and recognized before the parts. The brain sees the outline first, then we match that to patterns that we recognize, and then we look at the parts which make the object. So when we look at an object, we immediately recognize what it is, and then we start to break it down and look at all of the details. Here we have an example of the use of simplicity. You have the word logo, which is written in a very simple manner, with simple shapes and forms. In general, people, even when they're looking at complex images, they want to try and recognize the most simple forms in the image to recognize what they're looking at. And you see this type of um, technique used in advertising and other things where they want people to be able to recognize what they're looking at rapidly. Here we see an example of similarity and that means when you have objects that are similar, we've got squares and circles in blue, they're automatically going to become a group and these happen to be arranged in a regular pattern so that would make them a group automatically even if they were different colors. And we have another example of similarity here where we have a little bit of a change and the figure at the right is in motion. So you can add an element of surprise and a focal point by having similar objects grouped together when one of them, them is slightly different and it's also isolated from the group of three figures. In continuation, or the law of continuity, lines are seen as following the smoothest path. And you can see in this design here, which is a very simple design, you have all of the lighter blue circles at the top and they're all moving up in an upward direction, creating visual movement. In the Gestalt principle of closure, we have forms that are not completely outlined, but they have enough of an outline around them that we can still recognize what they are. And you can see that we have a triangle here, which is surrounded by circles at the edges and you have the famous logo of the panda bear by the World Wildlife Federation, and you can see that we can obviously see that it's a panda bear. In the principle of proximity, when objects that are similar or dissimilar are grouped together, they become a whole, and when they're farther apart, they're seen more separately. You can see the squares at the top are farther apart, and they don't become a group automatically, and the squares which are grouped together in a grid automatically become one form. In this example of proximity, we have 15 figures that form a tree. So when you have objects that are either the same or dissimilar that are grouped together, they can be seen as another image or as a group of some sort. In the principle of figure ground, we are going to see a form, a silhouette, 
or a shape as the figure or the object, and the surrounding area will be perceived as the ground or the background. In this particular image, we see that the figure ground changes because we see both the silhouette of a face and a shade. In this image, we see a complex figure ground relationship which change from the forms of a tree, water, and leaves. So here we can see in the principle of alignment, we have these uh, rectilinear forms and they're all aligned by their edges on a grid-like structure and they become a whole in gestalt. So here we see an example of center alignment and we have five different objects that are aligned on a horizontal line in a symmetrical fashion and they're automatically going to be seen as a group that way. Both of these techniques, center alignment and grid alignment, are often seen in website design and in other types of advertising. In the Gestalt principle of symmetry, objects that are grouped together in a symmetrical fashion will be seen as a whole object. So you can see in this image here that we see these two squares that are overlapping become one form together. So we don't see them as any of the other little images that they show you here. Your brain will kind of look at it and maybe see some of these forms, but instead of seeing them as separate parts, we see them as one form. This is another example of symmetry. All of these forms are grouped together as one shape, and you can see that you have closure here too with the outlines of the square in the center. The Gestalt principle of area means that if you have a smaller form, such as the purple triangle, over a larger form, such as the orange circle, the smaller form, the triangle, will be seen as the figure or the positive, and the larger form will be seen as the negative or the ground. So that concludes the lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. And now I'll just talk a little bit about specifics for the project. You're going to be making three or four small images of each Gestalt principle. They could be one by one inch or two by two inch squares. This should all be done on your graph paper. And you're going to be doing the same for each word description, which is in the assignment. You have to read all of the details in the assignment at Brightspace. And these should be done in ink on your graph paper. For the Gestalt principles, then you're going to choose two principles and your favorite of your three or four small designs, you're going to blow them up in black and white in color. The blow up could be two by two or four by four. For the word descriptions, you're going to blow up your favorite of each of your small designs for each word in an enlargement of two by two or four by four in black and white. If you want to, for all of these, you can use simple geometric shapes, organic shapes, or representational imagery. I'll leave it up to you. Just make sure to label which principles and which words are being described when you hand all of these in. And here's some examples of student works on the following slides. So these were some very cute little designs that she did, and she's done them labeling everything with the grid structure, which is what you want to do, and she chose to blow up actually four of the Gestalt principles in black and white and color. You're only required to do two of them. If you like to work a little bit larger, I believe hers were two by two, you can do them in uh, four by four blow up. Now this student did some very beautiful work for, for this project and he did a lot of figurative imagery and feel a lot of motion and interest in his designs using mostly, as you can see, asymmetrical designs. Here's some more examples um, from the same student. You can see he's got a lot of interesting use of the value pattern, which can be used to create emotional content in the work, a feeling of motion and drama. And here were the enlargements that he chose for his two principles, continuance and containment. You can see he actually used four different designs instead of doing, you're supposed to do one in grayscale and one in color, but they're still very beautiful. This is the last example of some of the Gestalt principles projects, and you can see they vary from using geometric simple shapes and forms to imagery, and I'll leave it up to you which you would like to use. And the last three slides are examples of the word description, so you're going to be describing these words order, increase, bold, tension, playful, and congested. You're going to do your three or four smaller examples 
using visual imagery, either simple geometry, non-objective, or representational to describe these words. And then you're going to pick your favorite of each one and blow it up in black and white. Now she actually did one of them in color in black and white. If you'd like to add a color addition, you can do that. She didn't blow up all of them for some reason. That must have been on another page, but these are nice little designs that she did, and this was all done digitally. These were done by the same student who used a lot of figurative images for his Gestalt principles, and he did the same thing for his word descriptions. You can see in these two examples, we have the smaller grid with all of the words described, and then they have their blow-ups on the same page. So depending on what size you do them, you can probably fit these on the same page if you'd like to. So this concludes all of the examples, and please be sure to watch the instructional video and also um, read everything else in the module to help you with this project, and I hope you enjoy it. Have fun. Take care.